Okay. Okay. Merci beaucoup, Wendy Wirtz, pour votre communication qui offre un contrepoint européen très intéressant. On voit que les problématiques sont souvent semblables et les cas sont très intéressants. On va en reparler après. Donc, euh, bienvenue à Georgina Glusman, qui est euh, donc euh, argentine, qui vient euh, de Buenos Aires pour nous parler euh, d'un sujet qu'elle a intitulé « Comment devenir une artiste femme professionnelle en Argentine » et qui va nous parler précisément, encore un cas, une étude de cas, de l'École supérieure des beaux-arts euh, en Argentine, à, Buen à Buenos Aires, dans les années 30, 1930-1940. Et donc, euh, elle nous parlera de cette école qui représentait, d'après elle, un espace privilégié pour de très nombreuses artistes. Et je un, dis un petit mot de son parcours. Elle est titulaire d'un doctorat en histoire de l'art euh, de l'Université de Buenos Aires depuis 2015. Et ses recherches se centrent sur euh, euh, les artistes argentines au, début du 19, au 19e siècle et au début du 20e siècle. Elle est l'auteur en particulier d'un livre, euh, je traduis en français, « Des traits invisibles, les femmes artistes à Buenos Aires, 1890-1923 ». Je lui laisse la parole et la remercie d'être venue de si loin pour 20 Merci minutes. Merci beaucoup. Bon, bonjour, je suis très reconnaissante à WER et aux organisatrices et pour toute l'organisation. Merci beaucoup d'avoir tenu ma proposition. Je ne vais pas parler en français, ça ne sera pas une bonne idée, croyez-moi. J'espère de pouvoir comprendre des questions. Um, so I begin. The Graduate School of Fine Arts, Escuela Superior de Bellas Artes, Ernesto de la Cárcova, was a center for advanced studies in the visual arts created in 1923 in the city of Buenos Aires by the painter Ernesto de la Cárcova. Its essential purpose was to deepen the training and artistic education of emerging artists in media such as painting, sculpture, printing, scenography, and mural painting. In the 1940s, new areas of expertise such as ceramics would be introduced to the curricula. From the 1920s until the late 1940s, the Graduate School of Fine Arts was a privileged horizon for many Argentine artists, including many women. The school's students were carefully selected among dozens of undergraduates of the fine arts academies nationwide, and even among some candidates who had been trained privately in what has been unanimously described as a very hard admission process. Fernando Moline, at first a student and then an instructor at the graduate school, would look back on the admissions. Each year, severe entrance exams selected a minimum of three or four students per workshop, but sometimes less, from a good number of applicants. Perfectioning technique was at the core of the educational model of the graduate school. My presentation today aims to contribute to a new reading of the Argentine art scene through the study of the training and careers of Argentine women artists from the 1930s to the end of the 1940s at the Graduated School of Fine Arts, often referred simply as La Carcova. My aim here is to revisit their experiences as women artists in a world in which the male artists dominated, that is to offer a reading of their gender experiences as emerging professional artists. Their careers and specific artworks will be discussed to better understand the impact of La Carcova on women artists, drawing from previously unknown archival material. So women artists in Argentina had developed several strategies to achieve some sort of integration uh, to the Argentine artistic milieu since the late 19th century. Private classes were the main source of training for these pioneer women artists. The women artists of the late 19th and early 20th century had, for the most part, belonged to upper social levels, and I mean extremely wealthy women. A remarkable example is the painter Maria Obligado de Soto y Calvo, who enjoyed wide recognition thanks to her works with national themes, such as this one, portraits and landscapes. Obligado trained privately in Argentina, where she studied with the Italian Jose Agujari, then she continued her studies under the guidance of Reinaldo Schurici. They were also the teachers to other young women of high society with artistic inclinations. 
Obligado would continue her artistic uh, training here in Paris, where she eventually would enroll at the Académie Julien. It was partly the privileged condition of women artists such as Marie Obligado that made it difficult for them in these early stages to be considered full professionals. In effect, until the late 1880s, women's artistic education had been limited to private classes as a turn and disciplines of male masters. This educational model reserved to upper class women coexisted with the opening of classes at the Academy of the Sociedad Estimulo de Bellas Artes, a pioneer institution that opened an art academy in 1878. The passage from learning done at home or in a small studio to one developed in a specialized setting and with a broad group signified a profound change. Moreover, it contributed to the emergence of a broader student population that included the middle classes. This private academy would be eventually nationalized in 1905. Dozens of graduates, both men and women, from this academy would go to develop artistic careers, sometimes notable and sometimes brief. For Ernesto de la Carcova, founder and first director of the Graduate School of Fine Arts, this was hardly surprising. The academy could only provide an initial training. For him, a special talents would need a special education. He would develop this at the Graduate School of Fine Arts. He knew the scopes and limitations of the academy, for he had been also his director. In 1908, he declared to a local newspaper, the educational concept cannot be applied only to those who have conditions of genius, because it is not possible to recognize at a glance, unless in elementary or preparatory courses, those who bring that special gift. That is why I wanted, during all the time that I remain at the head of the institution, to facilitate the study, so that those who really met the special conditions that today want to be searched full force, but without being found, could reach the upper courses in which the mentality conditions of each student are usually revealed. Karkova designed the original program for the Graduate School of Fine Arts. His initial plan underwent major changes and the successive directors of the institution, after Karkova's passing away in 1927, began the process of normalization of the school. The painter Carlos Ripamonte and Alfredo Guido, Karkova's successors, articulated clear lines for admission. Pretty soon, after the initial male-dominated years, many women would apply for a place at the graduate school. A rather large number of active women artists trained in La Karkova, but little is known about their education, their works, and their social networks. The period chosen for this presentation was for many of the most successful women artists of the Argentine scene marked by their experiences in La Carcova. Instead of taking their specific circumstances for granted, I would like to explore the peculiarities of the training. Unlike the National Academy of Fine Arts, where curricular segregation existed because of biases related to gender, the Graduate School of Fine Arts was marked by the relatively new mixed gender education. Men and women work side by side together at most of the workshops and all enjoyed a common sociability. The single workshop that seems to have been virtually close to women was the mural painting workshop. Many surviving images of this workshop show Alfredo Guido, the head of the school and also of this workshop, engage in grandiose projects with only male students. These projects often included working in spaces outside the school for rather long periods of time. For example, between September and December 1936, Guido and his collaborators undertook the mural decoration of the central pavilion and other units of the children's camp at Mondo Damicis, located near the school. The murals depicted boys and girls engaging in several outdoor recreations, enjoying vacations in the mountains or in the sea, playing hopscotch, or devoting their time to painting or playing music. In spite of this noteworthy exclusion, women were a major presence at the painting and printing workshops. The printing workshop, also directed by Alfredo Guido, attracted women from an early date. 
Noted artists such as Emilce Margarita Saforcada and Polish-born Aida Weisman forged their skills at the graduate school. Moreover, the once celebrated but now neglected sculptor and engraver Maria Carmen Portela attended the graduate school. In 1933, Portela started to practice the medium of gravure under the supervision of Alfredo Guido. Despite having experimented with several techniques, Portela preferred eventually dry point etching as her main form of expression. Portela developed a vast activity as an engraver and also as an illustrator of book, notably for the Sociedad Argentina de Bibliófilos, Argentine Society of Bibliophiles. Exhibited in various spaces, her graphic work won great recognition and was incorporated to the collections of general Argentinian and Uruguayan museums. Subtle lines and melancholy atmospheres dominate her work in the medium. The subtlety of her work is clearly perceived in works such as Maria Schitzke. The inner life of the subject, a young woman Portela portrayed several times, is rendered with a remarkable economy of means. Few women joined the sculpture workshop. In spite of their small number, some women students achieved great recognition as outstanding sculptures. This is the case of Antonia Artel, who, for example, exhibited in the National Salon, the Salon Nacional, from 1935 on. She had entered the graduate school only two years before, in 1933. Her second submission for the Salon was Reverie, a work executed precisely at the graduate school that was very well received by the critics. From then on, Artel would continue making art and teaching at the National Academy of Fine Arts. However, the successes gained by Artel would not be enough to guarantee her place in Argentine art history. Accepted female students usually chose to work at the painting workshop, for Argentine women artists already had a solid genealogy to join in this medium. Celebrated artists such as Manuela Ayes Monasterio and Angela Adela Bezzetti perfected their skills at the graduate school. The nude, was not a genre outside the usual practice of Argentine women. On the contrary, it was a genre where they seem to have felt exceptionally free to experiment. In the annual student exhibition of 1934, Consuelo Remedio González presented her work, Composition, a solid nude. A woman artist, perhaps uh, González herself, appears behind the model in what seems to be a rather simple studio we see. However, the image is far more complex. The two five figures are isolated from the objects usually depicted in these e scenes. Many critics censor her work, not because of the depiction of the female nude body, but because of the adoption of what was perceived as a modern style with, and I quote, purely material and plastic values, according to a uh, noted art critic, Fernan Félix de Amador. González' uh, work was criticized on stylistic grounds. The kind of modern figurative style she practiced at the school was not deemed suitable for women in the arts. The critical rejection she received reminds us of the often problematic links that have existed, both historically and historiographically, between modern styles and women artists. Women artists in Argentina had been able to draw from the nude from the late 19th century, but in the 1930s, they were beginning to be questioned for their stylistic choices. The school's scrapbooks include detailed inscriptions and contemporary newspaper clippings with accounts of the students' participation in the national salons, as well as in those of the cities of La Plata, Rosario, Córdoba, Santa Fe, Paraná, and Tandil. Many of the students of the graduate school were already artists with clear professional profiles, which was at least partially determined by their careful training and the kind of activities they engaged with during their time at school, particularly the annual exhibitions at the end of the school year. This situation is particularly interesting regarding women, since teaching had been the most common destiny for women who had trained at the National Academy. In sheer contrast, the Graduate School of Fine Arts allowed these women to imagine and create new kinds of professional identities. They did not receive merely artistic training, but time and space to work freely on their individual projects. 
classes were not strictly organized and students, whether male or female, could follow a path of their own. For women, the experience of liberty and public visibility seems to have been a turning point for their ambitions. Many of the most celebrated artists of the next decades were part of the graduated school, although many of them did not even finish their courses. The key for women and men was not having a diploma issued by the graduated school, but having been a part of its life-changing and thought-provoking atmosphere. La Carcova was not exactly a school with a clear series of steps towards a goal. Rather, it was a space for learning how to be an artist. This nonlinear process included an immersion in art history in the aesthetic classes. The testimony of the students' works in this area has been preserved in about 20 volumes of monographs. A look at this fragmentary record, which has spans the years 1932 to 1938, allows us to understand the diversity of interest developed by students throughout the 16 short papers that each one of them had to hand in annually. The old masters were often celebrated in these classes as a special group of people outside the human order. Despite this emphasis on a traditional art historical canon, a few students used this class to think on other artists and to highlight women's achievement in the visual arts. On the short research papers handed in periodically, students such as Elvira Ofelia Solari, Nelly Tamburini, Inés Navarro Clark, and Mane Bernardo explored the works of female artists. In 1937, Elvira Ofelia Solari analyzed the presence of women in the Impressionist group. That very same year, Nelly Tamburini reflected on Suzanne Balladon's work and career. The student praised Balladon for being more inclined to struggle than to tears. For Tamborini, Valadon was the best woman painter of the French contemporary scene. In 1938, Inés Navarro Clark, another student, went further. She explored both her family history and the history of art in Argentina through the careful examination of her great grandmother's work, the once celebrated painter Procesa Sarmiento de Lenoir, who had been an artist of distinguished activity and had worked both as a portraitist and as an art teacher. Navarro Clark chose to focus on Procesa's album. In at least one case, the interest in women artists reached those who were still active at the time. In 1938, Mane Bernardo wrote a review of the solo exhibition. Okay. Okay, okay, I'll try to, yes. Um, where was I? Uh, in at least one case, the interest in women artists reached those who were active at the time. In 1938, Mane Bernardo wrote a review of the solo exhibition of Austrian artist Maria Lili, who was already a celebrity in Buenos Aires. Even though she would only move to Argentina in 1939, Lidis began exhibiting her work throughout the art dealer Federico Müller several years earlier. Mane Bernardo wrote a lengthy review, considering the diversity of the works presented by Lidis. While she exalted the so-called feminine qualities of her work, she also praised the strength and her evident efforts towards technical perfection. The education in art history and aesthetics had been from the beginnings of the school, as significant as the training given to, as the training given at the studio art workshops. These non-normative choices, all by women students, stand out in the middle of literally hundreds of research papers on Manet, Cezanne, and Picasso. These students question the male canon taught at school. The female models prescribed by social mores would also be questioned by this generation of women artists who went on to excel in the fields of painter, sculpture, scenography, and ceramics. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Georgina Glusman, et merci à toutes les trois. Euh, pour euh, ses contributions euh, qui euh, s'attachaient à décrire les fonctionnements euh, des institutions 
euh, respectives de chacune des, des pays qu'on a traités, en tout cas pour la Belgique et pour, pour euh, l'Argentine, et aussi à Yéline Sao. Euh, cette approche, elle permet de découvrir, euh, et je crois que c'est un peu l'ambition du colloque, à la fois des artistes, des corpus d'œuvres assez peu identifiés, et en tout cas peu documentés, elle permet aussi de poser la question du, du statut très délicat euh, double de modèle et d'artiste. Et donc, euh, le retrait de, de la scène, justement, de, de la figure artistique quand elle est aussi modèle. Et elle permettait, ces trois contributions, euh, également de souligner encore les résistances masculines qui se sont manifestées pour euh, offrir, justement, aux élèves un, un accès égal à euh, la formation. Donc, euh, si j'ai bien compris, nos deux camarades peuvent comprendre le français à la droite, au bout de cette table. Et pour Yéline Zao, il faudra poser des questions en anglais. Donc, je laisse réagir à leur contribution avec des micros voilà, qui sont à votre portée. Um, I would like to thank all three contributions. It's very interesting. And um, uh, I would like to ask a question to we Wendy, uh, please. Uh, do you have uh, other examples of uh, uh, did um, uh <laughs> uh, the person of your, uh, what was his name? <laughs> Joseph Stalin. Yeah, exactly. Did he, s did he also make other kind of reformations in within the academy uh, for, for the um, uh, art education, such as, well, practical, which also included the male students. That was my question. Well, uh, I'm not sure. He was already appointed for three years, um, so not anymore for lifetime as was happening before. Um, I think he's realized this already, and he was very proud of this, uh, because he saw this as a major contribution to the academy. Um, the other, what he did towards the men, I cannot say. I do know that the other principals and heads after him also supported the women very much. They opened a sculpture studio, for example. Yes, but I'm sorry, I will have to say, I'm not sure I have to look at that. Thank you for your question. Thank you for all those presentations. Uh, there's so much to think about. But this question is for our Yellen. I wanted to uh, know a little bit more about uh, the work of Morin, her actually her uh, paintings. And I, you showed a couple, uh, but does that mean that you have not found many others? Or could you talk a little bit about where they might be or just what your search was like for that aspect of her work? Okay. Um, Um, there are actually, I, I could, um, as far as I know, um, I could only find three of her paintings, um, three all collected by um, the municipal, um, Musée Municipal uh, de, de l'Art et um, Histoire um, de Colombe. Um, the museum is closed at the moment in case you want to visit. <laughs> 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 But, um, so they collected the first painting in 2008, I think, uh, Le, um, Le Jour des um, Hameaux, um, and um, sep two more in later years. And I think they kind of is, is trying to build up something around uh, Victorine Mejon. And uh, the reason I only showed two is because I only have reproductions of these two. Um, the other one was under um, re reconstru reconstruction or reservation when, um, preservation when I asked for uh, more information on that one. And um, frankly speaking, um, Le, Le Priquet, um, that one was, I, I, I can't, um, they didn't give me any information about how they firmly attribute that painting to Mehon. So uh, I, I do have a question mark with that yet. Ah. Sur, sur la présence euh, donc, euh, des œuvres euh, de Victorine Meurand euh, donc dans les collections du musée municipal de Colombes, si j'ai bien compris, qui serait le seul endroit à détenir euh, des œuvres répertoriées. Euh, et c'est pourquoi Yéline Zao a montré donc, ces deux reproductions, ou trois reproductions. Mm -hmm. 
Et euh, donc, encore un travail reste à faire, d'autant plus que le musée est fermé, d'après ce que je comprends. Et sur un sujet comme ça qui mériterait euh, de, de poursuivre. Mm -hmm. So, oui. I'm holding the mic now, so I will ask the question. <laughs> Thank you all for your presentations. My question is for Georgina. Um, I was wondering, so these women were able to have professional careers in Argentina. I saw very quickly there was a mention of Florida, so I was wondering if they were able to work transnationally in America as well, and if so, were they really successful as professional artists there? Okay, thank you so much for your question. Yes, um, most of the artists that uh, were part of the graduate school uh, went on to develop quite successful careers. Um, for example, Emil César Forcada, who was uh, one of the members of the Engraven Workshop, uh, eventually uh, showed uh, one of her um, paintings at the MoMA, and the MoMA bought it. Uh, so many of them worked uh, very successfully, both locally and internationally, and this was fostered by the school. The school encouraged uh, transnational contacts, especially uh, in the region, um, for example, there was a huge exhibition of engravings that was taken through Brazil, uh, but many of them worked um, internationally, and this was uh, really a part of the process of being there. As I said, many of them did not even finish their courses, they never got their diplomas. They used the school very wisely and strategically. Euh, moi, j'ai une question pour Georgina. Et, euh, mais tout d'abord, j'aimerais euh, juste vous féliciter d'avoir réussi à reprendre euh, votre discours. Oh, merci beaucoup. Et euh, nous aimerions savoir, d'ailleurs toutes les deux avec Anna, euh, s'il y avait des pratiques euh, abstraites à la Karkova. Ah, ah mais c'est un sujet très compliqué. Et, no, not really. Uh, so abstraction developed in Argentina, uh, but it departed not from the traditional academies, but from the um, schools of decorative arts. So that was like a whole different path. The women who practiced uh, much successfully uh, abstract art uh, had been trained um, in uh, um, schools such as the ones we uh, have studied and have learned about um, during the, the morning. And these were the ones who developed abstraction uh, with, uh, you know, with success and with a certain visibility. Yes, but no, La Carco was a strictly figurative art. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was a good question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you very much for all these papers. And I got a question for Georgina. Uh, first, uh, I'm here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, well, first, that was so brilliant, and I'm quite surprised that the audience could eventually stop you, and you were so brave to keep on doing your paper. That was so, wow, amazing. Thank you for that. <laughs> and I got a question about sculpture. Uh, I wonder if um, you got some names of women that went to uh, Europe uh, to study sculpture more especially, uh, if they got some kind of fellowship abroad, um, and if you got some French names about teachers. Okay, Thank you. Yes. Um, so basically, when women began entering the graduate school, this replaced the, um, the traveling experience to Europe. So during the early 20th century, it was rather common for these extremely wealthy women to come to Europe. Uh, and most of them trained, the, the women sculptors who came to France, they trained with Bourdel. That was, you know, the, the standard practice. One of them developed a very successful transnational career. Her name was Hilda Einsko. She exhibited in France, she exhibited in England, but they belong to a rather different generation and they belong to a different social class. It's interesting how this whole uh, day was devoting to see the intersection between class and, and gender because it's not a variable or a factor we can simply dismiss. Um, the women from the 
generation before, the La Carcova uh, belonged to upper social classes. The women of La Carcova would never have the chance of coming to Europe and study for these long periods of time. But when they came, which was before, uh, they would choose Bordel above all. <laughs> Thank you so much. J'ai une question pour euh, Xavier en français d'abord, pour Yelin Zhao. Est-ce qu'il euh, y a des projets, euh, des travaux sur, en cours sur euh, Victorine Meurant Are there projects of exhibitions or articles or exhibitions, uh, whatever, about Victorine Meurant Because it's a largely unknown mm -hmm. artist. It's a largely known model, but yeah. large. And mm -hmm. uh, in reference to the exhibition we had here at Musée d'Orsay, about black models, I'm very interested yeah. to know. Um, um, I can't think, I mean, because it has such a limited collection of her works and there aren't, re to be frank, there are many things we know about her life apart from, you know, the list I just put up. It's, um, I, I, I would assume it would be very difficult to dedicate an entire exhibition to, to her mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. she is actually a case study among the three case studies mm -hmm. I did for my doctoral thesis. And um, I, I think actually, I, um, I didn't have time to get to this, but I find more interesting is that um, we probably shouldn't take Victorine Mahon as an, an, you know, one of the case that um, we have this um, heroic feminine artist, but rather we probably need to think why we cannot find more information on her and how do we carry on our research on a women or on a historical subject where we cannot find enough information. That is the question about the mm -hmm. archive that is no longer, not just search for new information, it is still important we look for alternative information that's mm -hmm. still hidden out there somewhere, but I think it's also important we have to acknowledge that some information has just not been preserved in the first place, so how do we carry on our research mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. such a fragmented and fragile archive? Mm -hmm. Donc, euh, pour résumer, euh, quoi que ce ne soit pas vraiment mon métier, euh, donc euh, Yéline Zhao nous dit que, en réalité, euh, le corpus n'est pas euh, encore complètement mis au jour, et donc on ne peut pas euh, imaginer un projet d'exposition qui se tienne dans la mesure où les œuvres ne sont pas encore toutes identifiées. Et euh, justement, ce qui est intéressant et, et qu'elle souligne, et qui est très, finalement la problématique qu'on souligne dans tout, tout au long de ce colloque, c'est que il y a euh, deux, 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 deux issues, deux, deux sujets, les œuvres elles-mêmes, les artistes elles-mêmes, mais aussi et surtout euh, les raisons pour lesquelles euh, ces artistes euh, sont si peu connus. Et donc on s'attache finalement à comprendre les mécanismes euh, qui les rendent euh, si peu visibles, là, tout au cours de ces présentations. Donc finalement, euh, c'est aussi une grande partie de notre réflexion aujourd'hui. Ce n'est pas seulement de découvrir des biographies d'artistes et des corpus, mais aussi tous les chemins difficiles qu'elles ont empruntés, ces femmes. <rire> 